Hey there! Welcome for this afternoon's episode. And I think everyone can relate to the topics for today, right, Ms. Nisha? Yes, we started that because we will talk about the brain and love, romance, class, and attachment. And we have two guests for this day that will help us in discussing the said matter. May I call on Mix Leonard Valencia and Mix Lynn Sarmiento. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's good to see you all here. Thank you for having us here as well. Um, without further ado, let's start. Um, so we're going to present the two chapters of the book entitled Why We Love, The Nature and Chemistry of Romantic Love by Helen Fisher, PhD. Shown in the screen, the title such as for chapter 3, we have the chemistry of love, scanning the bay in love, and for chapter 4 is the web of love, glass, romance, and attachment. We have prepared a few questions for the both of you to answer. First, what is love, Leonard? Um, well, for me, love's no gender. I agree, and to add, for me, love is in the air. Okay, moving on to the next question. Have you ever been in love? Well, me, no comment. What about you, Mix Lin? What an interesting question you got here. Well, as for me, I haven't been in love. How about you, Leonard? Um, same here, I have never been in love. All right, Mix Lin, you may now take the virtual stage. Thank you, Miss Nisha. Our quote for today is, For love is as strong as death, and its passion are as cruel as the grave, and its flashes of fire are the very flames of God. The Song of Songs, circa 900 to 300 BC. People sing for love, work for love, kill for love, and die for love. What causes this sort of romantic love is a universal human feeling produced by specific chemicals, but which ones exactly determined to shed some life and this magic that can make the sanest man go mad? Helen Fisher launched a multi-part project in 1986 to collect scientific data on the chemistry and brain circuitry of romantic love. She assumed that many chemicals must be involved in one way or another. She focused her investigation on dopamine, norepinephrine, as well as the related substance in the brain, serotonin. She looked into the nature of these chemicals for two reasons. First, the attraction animals feel for particular mates is linked with elevated levels of dopamine and norepinephrine in the brain. The second one, more important, all three of these chemicals produce many of the sensations of human romantic passion. Wrap on sweet dopamine. What is dopamine? Well, dopamine is a neurotransmitter. Elevated levels of this chemical in the brain produce extremely focused attention as well as unwavering motivation and goal-directed behaviors. These behaviors are central characteristic of romantic love. Lovers intensely focus on the beloved, often to the exclusion of all around them. They concentrate so relentlessly on the positive qualities of the adored one that they easily overlook the negative traits. They even dote on specific events and objects shared with their sweetheart. Besides lovers also regard their beloved as noble and unique. And dopamine has been associated with learning about noble stimuli. Central to romantic love is the lover's preference for the beloved. Take for example among prayer goals, a small mama. This favoritism is associated with heightened levels of dopamine in specific brain regions. And it is not a leap of logic to suggest that if dopamine is associated with mate preference in these small mammals, it can also play a role in partiality in people. Why? It is because all mammals have basically the same brain machinery, although size, shape, and placement of brain parts definitely vary. Ecstasy is another outstanding trait of lovers. This too appears to be associated with dopamine. Elevated levels of dopamine in the brain produce acceleration as well as many of the other feelings that lovers report, including increased energy, hyperactivity, sleeplessness, loss of appetite, trembling upon the heart, accelerated breathing, and sometimes mania, anxiety, or fear. The tendency and craving are symptoms of addiction and addictions are associated with elevated levels of dopamine. Is romantic love an addiction? Well, for Helen, it is an addiction. A blissful dependency when one's love is returned. A painful, sorrowful, and often destructive craving when one's love is spurned. Even the craving for sex with the beloved may be indirectly related to the elevated levels of dopamine. As dopamine increases in the brain, it often drags up levels of testosterone, the hormone of sexual desire. Norepinephrine is high. Norepinephrine is a chemical derived from dopamine. This may also contribute to levels high. The effects of norepinephrine are varied depending on the part of the brain it activates. Nevertheless, in 
increasing levels of the stimulant generally produce acceleration, excessive energy, sleeplessness, and loss of appetite, some of the basic characteristics of romantic love. Increasing levels of norepinephrine can also help explain why the lover can remember the smallest details of the beloved's action and cherished moments spent together. Serotonin, the third chemical that may be involved in the irresistible feeling of magic. The striking symptom of romantic love is incessant thinking about the beloved. Lovers cannot turn off their racing thoughts. Lovers are obsessed, and doctors who treat individuals with most forms of obsessive compulsive disorder prescribe SSRIs or selective serotonin reuptake. These substances elevates the level of serotonin in the brain. Lover's persistent involuntary irresistible ruminations about the sweet wine might be associated with low levels of some type of this chemical compound. There is a negative relationship between serotonin and its relatives dopamine and norepinephrine. As levels of dopamine and norepinephrine climb, they can cause serotonin levels to plummet. This can explain why a lover's increasing romantic ecstasy actually intensifies the compulsion to daydream, fantasize, and obsess about a romantic partner. A working hypothesis. Given the properties of these three related chemicals in the brain, dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin, Helen suspects that all played a role in human romantic passion. The feelings of euphoria, sleeplessness, and loss of appetite, as well as the lover's intense energy, focused attention, driving motivation, etc., might all be caused in part by heightened levels of dopamine and norepinephrine in the brain. And the lover's obsessive cogitation about the beloved might be due to decreased levels of some type of serotonin. The distinct correlation between numerous characteristics of romantic love and the effects of these three brain substances led to the following hypothesis. This fire in the mind is caused by elevated levels of either dopamine or norepinephrine or both, as well as decreased levels of serotonin. May I now call on Ms. Nisha to continue the topics on Chapter 3. Thank you, Ms. Lee. Now, for discarding the brain and love, Helen Fisher wanted to know which regions of the brain became active while one is feeling romantic rapture that might confirm which primary chemicals were involved. With the help of Simpson and Einstein, she comes to an idea of comparing the brain. Taking a photograph of the brain through a functional magnetic resonance imaging or fMRI machine to compare activity in the brain by looking at a photograph of two different people, one is his or her beloved and the other is just a natural photo of an acquaintance. For the next slide, to support the idea of generating love through photographs, psychologists Art in Depth launched an ingenious experiment with a device we came to call the love o -meter. The love o -meter is a computer-based experiment. In this study, people who are madly in love and intensely in love that could barely sleep or eat were chosen. And after this experiment, it was proven that photographs stimulate love. The next step is to put the lovers into the brain scanner and search for the circuitry of romantic ecstasy. In this experiment, men and women who had fallen crazily in love within the last few weeks or months, people whose romantic feelings are fresh, vivid, uncontrollably, and passionate are the subject. Subject must be willing to recline in a long, dark, cramped, icy machine while we scan their brains. Next is the passionate love skill. Psychologist Elaine Hatfield and Susan Spetcher created a survey called the Passionate Love Skill. It has 15 questions about romantic love, and based on the book, this will prove remarkably informative about the brain and love. Here's the sample of the love skill. As you can see, we have questions here that are uh, being used for this matter. Uh, Okay, so in the next part, there are three persons who were asked about their romantic relationship status. One is in the LDR but thought about his partner as much as 95% of the day and evening. The second person highlighted um, the word chemistry between her partner. And for the last one, um, he talked about being incomplete uh, without his partner. Through the participation of the three people, it indicated in the book that their brains have primordial passion, which is romantic love. When we say love, the color that we think of first is red, but in the brain, its active regions show bright yellow and deep orange. The nerve cells produce, store, and distribute neurotransmitters of different types, some, for example, synthesize dopamine, norepinephrine, and or serotonin. Many brain parts became active in each of our love struck objects. In addition, one important finding was activity in the cadet nucleus. The cadet helps us detect and perceive a reward. This 
discriminate between rewards, prefer a particular reward, anticipate a reward, and expect a reward. Those who scored higher on the passionate love skill also showed more activity in a specific region of the candidate when they look at the picture of their sweetheart. Activity in other regions of the reward system, including areas of the septum in a brain region that becomes active when people eat chocolate. Explain, Art. And we are now in the dopamine mother loop. Mix and Mel will discuss that love is associated with dopamine or norepinephrine. The BTA or ventral tegmental area is the source of the dopamine. With their tentacle-like axons, these nerve cells distribute dopamine to many brain regions, including the caudate nucleus. And as this sprinkler system sends dopamine to many brain parts, it reduces focus attention as well as fierce energy, concentrated motivation to attain a reward, and feelings of elation, even meaning the core feelings of erotic love. That is why it's not surprising that lovers talk from night to morning and always doing ex something extra for their boyfriend or girlfriend. Next is how love changes. The insular cortex collects data from the body regarding external touch and temperature, as well as internal pain and activities of the stomach, gut, and other viscera. Due to this brain part, we register butterflies in the stomach, a pounding heart, and are many other bodily reactions. Parts of the insular cortex also process the emotions. As a relationship lengthens, brain regions associated with emotions, memory, and attention begin to respond in new ways. This function of brain parts totally nobody has any idea. Next is love's complex chemistry. The prefrontal cortex must be involved. This assemblage of brain regions that lie behind the forehead is called the central executive because it collects data from our senses, which them, integrates thoughts and feelings, makes traces, and controls our basic drives. It is here that we listen, deliberate, and decide. With various regions of the prefrontal cortex, we also monitor rewards. And several parts have their recollections to the audit nucleus. Lastly, for this chapter, the drive to love. Romantic love is associated with dopamine and or other culturally related neurotransmitters in the brain. And art's theory that romantic love is primarily a motivation system rather than an emotion. I think the experience of falling in love lies somewhere along this continuum. Romantic love does seem to be associated with dopamine, and because this passion emanates from the college nucleus, motivation and goal-oriented behaviors are involved. Very important, all of the basic drives are associated with elevated levels of central dopamine, so is romantic love. And like all the other drives, romantic love is a need, a craving, we need food, we need water, we need warmth, and the lover feels he or she needs the love. That's it for Chapter 3. Let's begin our chapter 4 with the topic on lust. Lust is a primordial human feeling, it is unpredictable too. The craving for sexual fulfillment can pop up anytime and this is different from romantic love. People in quite different cultures can easily distinguish between these feelings. They even have terms for love and lust in their own language. These people were also correct to regard these feelings as distinct. Scientists have recently established that lust and romantic love are associated with different constellations of brain regions. Next is the hormone of desire. Do you know that in some parts of our world, they believe that certain food can change the last person? Like for Europeans, they have this love apple. For the Chinese, it's the sea slug because this strange animal enlarges when touch. Nature has made only one true substance to stimulate sexual desire in men and women, and it is testosterone. And to a lesser degree, it's skin, the other male sex hormones. That is why those male athletes so inject testosterone to elevate their strength and stamina, have more sexual thoughts, more more interactions, more sexual encounters, and more orgasms. In the same way, men who take testosterone, it boosts their sexual desire. When it comes to sexual desire, people vary because levels of testosterone are inherited. Both sexes and fewer sexual fantasies must survey less regularly and engage in less intercourse as they age. With each, the levels of testosterone decline. Contrary to what Mix Leonard said about romance triggers loss, here, according to the book, loss does not necessarily lead to the passion and obsession of romantic love. This is not to say that loss never triggers romantic love. It can. Sexual relationship can trigger a person to fall in love, but not everyone goes the same way of relationship. When middle-aged men and women inject testosterone or apply testosterone cream to various body parts to stimulate their sex drive, their sexual thoughts and fantasies increase, but they don't fall in love either. The brain circuitry of loss does not necessarily ignite the furnace of romance. In the weeks and months that followed, um, we have here an example. In the in the weeks and months that followed, she told me she lay awake at night and thought of him constantly, waited by the phone to hear his voice, dressed attra attractively to win him, uh, and fantasized about a life together. Fortunately, he loved her, too. The chemistry of romantic love can trigger the chemistry of sexual desire, and the fuel of sexual desire can trigger the fuel of romance. This is why it is dangerous to copulate with someone with whom you don't wish to become involved. Although you intend to have casual sex, you might just fall in love. Romantic passion also has a special relationship with feelings of attachment. 
Next slide. Um, this time, love changes over time. It becomes deeper, calmer. Psychologist Elaine Hatfield calls this feeling companion need love. A feeling of happy togetherness with someone whose life has become deeply entwined with yours. Um, I call this complex feeling attachment. Um, when two people are first together, Nisa said, their hearts are on fire and their passion is very great. After a while, the fire cools and that's how it stays. Next slide, please. Okay, subsequently, a British psychiatrist, John Balby um, proposed that humans have evolved an innate attachment system consisting of specific behaviors and psychological responses. Most now believe that the pastopocin and oxytocin, closely related hormones made largely in the hypothalamus and the gonads, produce many of the behaviors associated with attachment. Uh, this time, I think it's your turn, Ms. Nisha. As we all know, oxytocin is being produced during and after childbirth, but somehow it is also involved in the feelings of two adults, male and female, when cypressin and oxytocin are secreted during sexual intercourse. These two are also known as the satisfaction hormones. These chemicals undoubtedly contribute to the feeling of contentment, calmness, and attachment that two adults might felt after sweet sex. So we can say that oxytocin is another cocktail for devotion. Increasing levels of testosterone can sometimes drag down levels of osuprosin and oxytocin, and elevated levels of osuprosin can decrease levels of testosterone. This inverse relationship between loss and attachment is dose dependent. It varies depending on the quantities, timing, and interactions among several hormones. But high levels of testosterone can reduce attachment. This profile gate fathers have high levels of testosterone. As a man's marriage becomes less stable, his levels of testosterone rise. And a single man tend to have a higher levels of testosterone than married men. Even when a man holds a baby, levels of testosterone can decrease. Next, we can say that as romantic love matures, it often develops into hundreds of complex and satisfying feelings of attachment. After the child is born, parents need a whole new set of brain chemistry and networks to raise their child as a team. The chemistry of attachment. As a result, feelings of attachment often dampen the ecstasy of romance, replacing it with a deep sense of reunion with a baby. And now we are down to the last topic for this episode. Let's get into Miss Lee. Feelings of love. Romantic love triggers lust. With time, the raw feelings of love become attachment. These three brain circuits, lust, love, and attachment, can ignite in any combination. Let's see, for example, have you watched a K drama? If you have, have you noticed where a man and a woman meet, they talk and laugh and begin to date, rapidly or gradually, they fell in love. As their relationship deepens, then which escalates to complete happiness, their sex drives surges into higher action. Then, as they grow old, their raging romantic passion and raw sexual hunger begin to wane, replaced by warm afterglow, attachment. In this sample scenario, romantic love has triggered lust, then with time, the raw feelings of passion and desire have settled into attachment, an emotional union and commitment. Another example is have you ever read a manga or a webtoon rather where a man and a woman have sex irregularly and one day the man felt possessive. Soon they fell in love and over time they become emotionally entwined. In this case, lust has preceded romance which then led to attachment. There are also cases where couples actually begin their relationship with feelings of attachment. For example, you meet someone in college, you become friends and achieve emotional union. With time, this attachment turns into romantic passion which finally triggers lust. But there are also cases where these three mating drives do not focus on the same person since we are neurologically able to love more than one person at a time. For example, you have a long-term boyfriend who goes to a different school. He feels profoundly attached to you but while at school, he feels romantic passion for his classmate, and he feels the sex drive while reading a book or watching a movie unrelated to you. So as you can see, romantic love, lust, and attachment can visit us in different sequences or unexpected combinations. The next topic is types of love. The ancient Greeks were the world's masters at scrutinizing various kinds of love. They had over 10 words to distinguish different types. Psychologist John Allen Lee reduced these overlapping categories into six. The most celebrated is Eros, or passionate, sexual, joyful, high-energy love for a very special partner. Eros is a combination of lust and romantic love. Mania is obsessive, jealous, irrational, possessive-dependent love. Most people are exceedingly 
obsessive, illogical, and possessive when they are passionately in love. Ludus is a playful, unserious, uncommitted, detached love. These lovers can love more than one person at a time. For them, love is a theater, an art form. Ludus appears to be a variation of mild lust coupled with fun and frivolity. Storch is an affectionate, companionate, brotherly, sisterly, friendly kind of love. A deep and special friendship that lacks a display of emotion. These people prefer to talk about their interests rather than their feelings. Storage is a form of attachment. Agape is a gentle, unselfish, dutiful, all-giving, altruistic, often spiritual love, another form of attachment. These lovers regard their sentiments as a duty, not a passion. Some are even willing to give up the relationship when it is best for the beloved. Hence, they will surrender willingly to a rival. And the last one is pragma, love based on compatibility and common sense, pragmatic love. This is a shopping list type of love. Pragmatic lovers keep scores. They look for the perks of the relationship as well as its flaws. These men and women are not moved to excessive sacrifice or emotion. For them, friendship is the core of the relationship. Helen doesn't regard pragma as love at all. Sternberg divides love into three basic ingredients, passion, including romance, physical attraction, and sexual craving, intimacy, all of those feelings of warmth, closeness, connectedness, and boundedness, and decision or commitment, the decision to love someone and the commitment to sustain that love. For him, infatuation is composed of passion only, romantic love is passion plus intimacy, consummate love is passion, intimacy, and commitment, companionate love has intimacy and commitment but it is devoid of passion. Empty love has only commitment. Liking is based on intimacy. One feels no passion and no commitment. And Fatou's love is often full of passion and commitment, but lacks intimacy. Our last topic for today is the Mad Symphony of Romance. Romantic love certainly has subtle variations, as well as intricate and varied relationships with its kindred reproductive crimes, lust, and attachment. Love is a symphony of feelings with many notes and chords. To make matters even more complex, the brain network of romantic love melts with many more brain systems with circuits for basic drives, as well as with many emotions, memories, and thoughts. All these ingredients add fantastic depth, nuance, and spice to our feelings of romance. Certainly, our emotions contribute to romantic passion. The basic emotions are universal, inherited, involuntary, rapidly expressed, portrayed everywhere with the same facial pulses, hard to fake and often difficult to control. Among them are joy, fear, anger, sadness, disgust, and surprise. Have you ever felt an irresistible urge to call or chat with your crush? You can become engulfed with fear that your crush has gone out with your rival, then overwhelmed with joy as your crush replies that he or she likes you too. Then come out by surprise and disappointment as the celestial being breaks the meet-up you had planned together. Romantic love is also linked to a host of more complex feelings such as respect, admiration, loyalty, gratitude, sympathy, apprehension, bashfulness, nostalgia, remorse, even the sense of fairness. Philosopher Dylan Evans calls these higher cognitive emotions because they are not fast acting or associated with specific facial mannerisms. People in different societies express them in different ways and at different times, and men and women are often able to conceal and fake them. Calm, tension, contentment, anxiety, mild pain, mild pleasure, and other general bodily states also contribute to feelings of romantic love, as neurologist Antonio Damasio calls it background emotions. This provides the landscape of the body, the persistent mood that accompanies us as stronger emotions and motivations ebb and surge. This choice of emotion and motivation is ironically ordered in a way. Fear can overcome joy, for example, jealousy can stifle tenderness. But in the speaking order of basic and complex emotions, background feelings and powerful drives of romantic love holds a special place. Romantic love can dominate the drive to eat and sleep. It can stifle fear, anger, or disgust. It can override one's sense of duty to family and friends. It can even triumph over the will to live. Each of us is wired somewhat different. Some are predisposed to happiness, others to calm, anxiety, fear, or anger. Some are unsociably curious, others wonderfully amusing. 
Scientists say that about 50% of our temperament is inherited. The rest is molded by our upbringing and environment. But we all share with wondrous and devilish thing called romantic love. Alright, thank you so much, Helene, for that. We have another quote here that I will read for you guys by William Shakespeare. Love, comfort, like sunshine after rain. This is from the, the complete sonnets and poems by Shakespeare. Nisha? Okay, it's a wrap. Thank you very much to our visitors for this lovely afternoon. Mix later, Galesha and Miss Lee Sarmiento. I hope the viewers out there have learned something new about romantic love. Bye!